Hey there, I'm Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Mount Moriah. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, I do. I, I love it that I can worship with Mount Moriah, the Mount, as, as uh, Melody calls it. Um, and, and I so want to get into that, that we start calling this place the Mount, and I've tried, um, and, and we'll get there. But I love being able to worship with you guys when, when I'm not here. Um, we're sitting in, in our resort at uh, Tennessee. Uh, and it's like when you get up and you, you put a little screen on, and I actually had to make sure I had the volume turned down on this this morning because I'm putting this up on the coffee table and we're all sitting around. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, I was worshiping here with Mount Moriah, but I'm going to tell on, on our, one of our sound guys, uh, he was watching North 10 Mile. And, and I'm telling you what, it just it's great to know that we can worship together. Uh, but Ford, uh, again, did an excellent job. Uh, there were a lot of exciting things that happened last week, and I was glad that I got to be a part of it. But seeing all these names when I, when I was down there, Melody Ellsworth was sharing our broadcast, and I know some of you at home watch because Melody puts that up there. My wife does the same thing. They put it on uh, and, and broadcast it, make sure they share it so everybody can watch. And I'm seeing all these names, and I'm noticing names from Smithfield, Fair Chance, uh, there's a couple from Uniontown. Uh, I, I won't give the n actual names, but some of you could be here. And, and I'm like Bob. Every once in a while, we wouldn't mind seeing them. <laughs> I mean, it would be great to have them here to worship with us. So turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 10 through 20 specifically. Um, but it was an interesting uh, passage to me uh, during my studies and, and uh, it, it's kind of one of those ones that we look at and we're like, man, it seems so harsh. And, and then we're wondering what Jesus is actually doing uh, because we've got scribes and Pharisees that are at Jesus' heels the entire time uh, that he is doing his earthly ministry. And, and so this is during one of those events where the Pharisees and the scribes, they're, they're just all over Jesus. Um, and some of us look at this passage and we read straight through it and we begin to start wondering, well, is Jesus disobeying God's law here? Is Jesus, um, you know, doing what, what they're saying? It are you nullifying the law? And, and, and Jesus even has says in other places that I'm not here to, to nullify the law. I'm not here to, to make it go away. But what I'm here is to fulfill the law. And in passages like this, it actually looks like Jesus is just simply being defiant. And we begin to question, well, what is Jesus really doing here? And we see that, that he is beginning to take these disciples, the, these Jewish men, and, and, and it almost feels like he's leading them to be rebellious just like he is. And there is a rebellion about Jesus. But there is never disobedience. There is never sin. There is never disrespect for God. There is never the, this uh, out and out disrespect for, for the order that God had created and the, the order that God uh, really demands uh, of his people. And it's not a, an order to the sense that, that it is this dictatorship, but it is this order that just allows life to be lived to the fullest for everyone. For everyone, and there's a, a lot of stuff in these passages here in Matthew chapter 15 that, that begins to show that there are some people that, that it, it just doesn't sit well with them. And so when we look at Matthew chapter 15, uh, verses 10 through 20, I'm going to read that passage and then we'll go back a little bit further. It says this, summoning the crowd, he told them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then the, disciple came up, the disciples came up to him and told him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard this statement? And he replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant will be uprooted, so leave them alone. They are blind guides, and if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. Then Peter replied to him, Explain this parable to us. Are even you still lacking in understanding, he asked. Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a man. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, 
adulteries, sexual immoralities, theft, false testimonies, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So in the very end, that last verse, it kind of uh, reveals to us what Jesus is talking about. In, in the first 10 verses in this passage, Jesus and the disciples are walking along and all of a sudden they decide that they're going to, to have a snack and they're going to eat. And as the Pharisees are looking, they see that Jesus isn't requiring them to wash their hands before they eat. Now we have our kids wash their hands before they eat for much different reasons. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, but it is it, 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 during uh, our vacation. I can't tell you how many times we sat down and, and Joyce would say to the kids, we all need to get up and go wash our hands because we've been touching way too much stuff. <laughs> and it's kind of what was going on here. Uh, Jesus and the disciples, they're hungry. So they begin to eat and the, the elders and the scribes came up and said, you don't care about our traditions. And Jesus answered them uh, in verse three. And he says, uh, three and four, why do you break God's command because of, your, tradi of uh, your tradition? For God said, honor your father and your mother. The one who speaks evil of a father or mother must be put to death. Then he goes down a little bit further and he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching a doctrine, teaching as doctrine the commands of men. So this gives us a picture of what's happening. Jesus looks to be being defiant. Jesus looks to be requiring his disciples to follow along. There's another passage in scripture where Jesus actually walks into a meal and just bypasses the whole ceremonial washing altogether, sits down and begins to eat. And of course that causes problems. And we begin again to look and argue back and forth. What is it that we're looking at here? But Jesus in using this begins with a teachable moment. Number two of, uh, or number two of our pa um, <laughs> outline this morning if you're following along online it's looking at verse 10 oftentimes when we see these teachable moments and, and I'm like this in, in many situations if something happens I'm like hey why don't we come over here and let's talk about this why can't we talk about this just the two of us will we'll come over here and I'll explain what's going on and 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 the two of us or the three of us will, will be perfectly fine and completely understand but Jesus doesn't do things that way. I love this. Because when Jesus calls out the Pharisees and when Jesus calls out the scribes, it says that he summoned the crowd. That means everybody within Jesus' ear, Jesus says out loud something to this effect. Why don't you all come over here and let's have a conversation. And let's talk about what we've just experienced. He's been reprimanded by the Pharisees and, and he's beginning to look at them. And he begins his speech or his talk or his teaching with listen and understand. In other places in scripture we hear Jesus beginning things like this with let him who has an ear hear. And so anyone within the sound of his voice has the opportunity to listen to what he's going to say. And I believe in this passage specifically, Jesus is even expecting them to understand exactly what he's talking about. I don't think there's a whole lot of masking going into this. I don't think there's a whole lot of, uh, of secretive or, or mystical talk when Jesus begins this conversation. Here's the whole takeaway for the crowd, and I believe it is for us as well. In verse 11, he says, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. So what Jesus is talking about is possibly two things. But let's talk about what the word defile means first, because some of us get a little, you know, bent out of shape about, well, what does defiling mean? Defiling by biblical uh, stance or, or by biblical definition means that something is polluted, it's corrupted, or becomes unclean. When we boil all those things together, what it really says is it's sinful. 
It's sinful. Now, Ford talked a little bit last week about what sin and the results of sin uh, can, can do, where it puts us in relationship to God and really uh, determines our eternal destination. And so I appreciated that because what Jesus is really saying here is what we're eating or what we're not eating or, or what we're talking about here, this defilement, is a lot bigger deal than just whether or not you've got clean hands or not. What's going on here is a determination of your relationship with me and ultimately where you're going to spend eternity. And I think it's interesting because when we hear words about like defilement, we're, we're like, well, that, that's pretty bad. Or we hear things about like, well, we're polluted. Well, that, that's pretty bad. But when we really begin to understand what sin is, And the understanding that the penalty and the wages of sin is death, separation from God. What Jesus is talking about here is a big deal. It's a big deal. It's not just this whole thing. And when when I put the title to this, I I, I said it's not just about food. And and I know I caught some of your attention uh, with that because you know how much I love food. But it's not about the food here. It's about sinful behavior. It's about where sin begins and, and where, uh, wh- how sin can pervade throughout our lifestyles. And, and so what happens is, is that defilement means that we're unable to come into the presence of God or we're separated from God for eternity. It's a big deal. So what's Jesus talking about well, when he's talking about what's going into your mouth? Well, there's two things that Jesus could be talking about here, and I believe that both of them uh, are, are uh, relevant. Uh, food is the first thing. He, I mean, it's, it's no secret. He's talking about what he's eating. Uh, so what he is eating, or what the disciples have been eating, or, or, or later on we're going to find out what everybody can eat, there was a big deal about that. There, there was something that uh, pa- Peter t- was taught later on that, that food isn't a big deal when, when we see that Peter is uh, in his vision and, and a, 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 a sheet comes down from heaven uh, and he sees every animal in that sheet. And Jesus says to Peter, take it and eat it. And Peter's like, no way. I can't do that. There's a little bit of bacon in there. Might be a little bit of shellfish in there. And Peter says, no, those things are unclean. And he's reprimanded immediately that what God has made, nothing that God has made is considered unclean. God gets to decide what's unclean. And so what he's doing is he's beginning to to show that that there is this uh, likelihood between the Gentiles and the Jews, but he uses food to demonstrate it. Paul has to remind Timothy later on that there are going to be people that are going to be coming up and teaching him that certain foods are are unclean and certain foods are clean. So even Timothy has to be reminded that that these foods, uh, some foods are, are unclean, some foods are clean. God says, no, from this point on, all food is clean. Now, the second thing that he could be talking about here is ceremony and tradition. And this is what I believe is the main focus And when we see ceremony and tradition, we're talking about man-made ideas that tried to create or mimic holiness. It wasn't holiness itself, but it was made to appear to be holy. It was made so so that we would appear uh, to to create this holiness around us, almost a self-righteousness. Godquestions.org describes what these ceremonies and traditions were. It said that the scribes and the Pharisees had added so many of their own ideas to God's law that the common people were confused and felt helpless to obey it all. Now, I wanted you to hear that because it's important. It says that the Pharisees had added so many ideas. The Pharisees had added so many rules and regulations that people began to get confused. Well, is that a Pharisaic? law or is that a mosaic law is that a law that that some man some religious person has made up or is that God's law and so as people began to get confused the tradition and the ceremony began to creep in and be so much more important than what God's law actually was 
Now, the original intention, sometimes we, we give the Pharisees a, a little bit of a break because we believe some of their original intentions were, well, we don't want to break any of the big laws, so let's make a whole bunch of little laws that, that keep us from even getting closer to the big laws. So we can give them a little bit of a break there, but then what began to happen was the little laws, the man-made laws, became the most important. And what it was all about was the Pharisees were able to have authority over the people and they were beginning to share their own ideas and their own laws as God law. And so why would we do this? Well, some of it was legitimate fear. We don't want to sin, so we want to avoid even getting close to sin. Some of it was selfishness. Some of it was self-righteousness. Some of it gave them this sense of authority. And we see Jesus addresses it in the previous verses as to how they began to even use it for their own gain. They would sit there and say, well, I'm not going to take care of my parents because I have to give my offering to God. And so they began to neglect people. They began to neglect the principle of loving God and loving others so that they could keep more for themselves. And they were crooked. Uh, it, it began to, to just snowball upon them to where, it, it, just like every sin that we have, it, it, it entraps them. And they begin to love it more and more until it begins to destroy them from the inside out. You see, this ritualistic hand-washing before meals, the observance of this tradition had nothing to do with cleanliness. The Pharisees' concern was simply ceremonial purity. And it had nothing to do with the Mosaic commandments required. The Mosaic re commandments required no such thing as hand-washing. But the Pharisees did expect people to conform to this custom nonetheless. Now, the disciples would have been familiar with that. They grew up in a Jewish community. They had Jewish moms and dads. And so their Jewish moms and dads would have handed down these traditions because they had been taught from their parents and their grandparents. And so as it got down to the disciples, there probably was, as Jesus was feeding them, there probably were a few disciples that are looking around going, do you think we should wash our hands first? I mean, he just gave me a Big Mac and expects me to eat this? There probably was a little bit of that concern. But the way Jesus does things, the freedom that Jesus had, the freedom that Jesus offers, allowed the disciples to partake in this. And you've been there, right? You've been there, you've gone to a meal, and you know, you're, you're not allowed to eat Taco Bell. You've never eaten in a Taco Bell all your life. But the youth pastor comes along, <laughs> And he invites you to go out to eat lunch with him. And you drive to a place called Taco Bell. And he says, what would you like to have? I've never been here. My parents don't believe in Taco Bell. And he has a taco for the first time. I don't even know if Taco Bell really serves tacos. I don't know what those are. <laughs> but this person now has the freedom to go to Taco Bell. Anytime he wants. If Pastor Daryl can do it, then I should be able to do it. Now that puts a lot of responsibility on Pastor Daryl. I get it. But it's probably how the disciples began to feel. They began to see this liberty, this freedom that Jesus had. And the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, it, it, it drove them nuts. But what Jesus was basically beginning to show them was that this food, this ceremonial cleansing, had no power to make them unclean. Jesus says it's no power whatsoever. There, there's no significance to it whatsoever. So does it really have the power to make you clean? If it didn't have the power, if the food doesn't have the power, it, it doesn't have the power to make you unclean, does it have the power, the ceremony have the power to make you clean. I mean, that's the question that logically has to come from this. So we go on and we see that Jesus says, it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles you. 
Now, I like the, the descriptions in here. I like how Scripture, and if you go deep into the, the study of it, it, it talks about how the, the things that go into your mouth uh, go through your stomach. Uh, and in this passage, it says nice that it, it just kind of exits, right? Um, in the actual translation, it actually says it exits into the latrine. I wanted to share that with you because I thought some of you give you guys a little bit of a picture and some of you would appreciate that. That's the actual idea and that's kind of what Jesus was really saying. The stuff that you eat is just going to pass through your stomach and it's going to end up in the, the latrine, the, the toilet. Um, and my daughter, if she listens to that, is going to love that because Bluey says that all the time. But what happens is, is what it does mean when he says that this is coming out of our mouth and it's what Peter wanted to know in verse 15, is that both our words and our deeds are what is heard and what is seen. So what does Jesus mean when he says what comes out of the mouth? That's what defiles you. He says what you speak and what you do, your actions, what people hear and what people see, that's what defiles you. Our words and our deeds are a result of what we think, what we desire, and what we believe. What we think what we desire and believe will determine how we behave. That's one of my favorite studies. We did a study in John years ago. And John's whole idea when he wrote his gospel was that you would hear about the word of God. That, that you would believe the word of God. And then it would change the way you live your life. Jonathan did some of those studies with us when we were doing youth group together years ago. And I love that phrase. What we think, what we desire, and what we believe will determine how we behave. It's not about behavior modification. It's just an, a result that happens. So usually if we think it is going to taste bad, what? We don't eat it, right? I love those things. You, you, a person takes a bite and says, oh, that's terrible. Taste this. <laughs> Right? You've had people do that, right? And you're like, no way. <laughs> My kids do that to me all the time. The bean boozled uh, of the, those, they're like the, the jelly beans that taste like grass and, and supposed to taste like boogers. And my kids are like, spin this little wheel and you got to eat a blue one. Well, what's the blue one taste like? Well, it could be blue raspberry or it could be boogers. Mmm. <laughs> Let me try that. 50-50 chance, 50-50 chance, no thank you. <laughs> if it tastes bad or we think it's going to taste bad, we're not going to taste it. Usually, if we believe it's wrong or it's dangerous, we're not going to do it, right? Usually. If it's wrong or if it's dangerous, usually something in our mind will convince us, not a good idea. But here's where the problem comes in. Here's where the problem comes in. If we desire it, if we desire it, we will say or do anything. If we desire it, we'll say or do anything. Well, I know that jelly bean is going to taste like boogers, but man, the temptation is just there. Man, if I, if I drive down this highway at 120 miles an hour, I know the likelihood is that I'm going to be in, in an accident. But man, the RPMs, the sound of the engine, wind in my hair. The Jeep won't go 120 miles per hour. At least I, I don't think it will. <laughs> but man, that addiction person that I work with, the, the people that I'm around, if your desire is there, even though you know it's dangerous, even though you know it's wrong, desire has such a strong hold on us. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he mentions the heart. It's our thoughts. It's our desires. Verse 18 Jesus says, what comes out of your mouth, what is heard or seen, comes from the heart. What is your heart? Well, it's not the physical organ that Jesus is talking about. What Jesus is talking about is the seat of our passions. It's the seat of a person's intelligence. 
It's a seat of a person's will or desires. It's what's on your mind or in your mind. It's what we think. It's what we desire. And it's what we believe. Jesus is talking about these things that come from the heart, that come from our desires. And he says, this is what is going to determine whether you're clean or you're unclean. Your heart is going to determine whether you're clean or you're unclean. Matthew uses this as an example. Matthew and Mark both talk about this story. They both give extensive lists, but probably not complete lists of all the thoughts and all the behaviors that give evidence that someone is being defiled. Someone is acting in sin and thus being separated from God. Matthew uses a shorter list. He says evil thoughts, there's murders, there's adultery, there's sexual immorality, there's theft, there's false testimony, And there's blasphemies. And what I want you guys to see in that list is we see that there is some things that just exist in a person's mind. There are some things that people are actually acting out and doing. And then there are some things that aren't even towards other people, but they're involving their relationship with God. When it gets to the blasphemy, it's giving credit to to something else or someone else for what God has done or can do. Blaspheming is disbelieving who God is and what God can do. So that's what Matthew uses. Mark actually gives a little bit of a longer list in Mark chapter 7, verse 21. He says, From within, out of people's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, evil actions, deceit, self-indulgence, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Some of those things are just attitudes that we have within our hearts. And what God or what God and what Jesus is revealing to people here is that our hearts, human hearts, are evil. Human hearts desire what is evil. We just we run to it. We run to it. And you say, Well, no, no, not me. I've never murdered anyone. I don't even think I've ever wanted to murder anyone. And Jesus says, that's, a really, that's great. That's a good idea. But Jesus tells us in another passage that you've heard that it's wrong. You've heard that it's against the commandments to, to kill someone. But I tell you that if you even hate your brother or your sister, then you've already committed the act. Well, I've been tempted. There's a difference between temptation and giving, giving weight to that idea. Being tempted is, and I love this from Beach Week years ago, being tempted is when uh, a gentleman sees a, a lovely lady in a bikini walking down the beach. Temptation is, saw that, might want to look at that again, but nope, decide not to. That's temptation that has been avoided. A lustful thought is, wow, that, that looked great. Do I have my mirrored sunglasses over here someplace? Maybe if I act like I take a picture of someone else and get a picture of, that's when your thought life has caused you to sin. And then we know what the next step is. Maybe if I asked her out for lunch, well, what would your family think of that? And that's acting. So there's temptation, and we can avoid it, and God says that he even gives us us a way to escape, tells us to resist the devil and he'll free from us. I mean, there's a whole lot of things. You, You run from temptation. But you can sin in your thought life, and you can certainly sin in your actions. And that's what Paul Uh, That's what Matthew, that's what Mark are are recording here from Jesus, and Paul even addresses that later on. Notice all of these, and sometimes we don't like to admit it when we get into envy and slander and foolishness, maybe even deceit, but all of these are direct disobedience to God's commands. 
Not just the ten, but especially the two greatest commandments. In Matthew chapter 22, 37 through 40, Jesus tells us that the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself and all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the principle of all of the other commandments, all of the other laws in the Mosaic is about loving God. It's about loving others. And there's even in there a couple of how God protects you. Being obedient to that is loving yourself. I mean, those are all in there within the Ten Commandments and especially within those two. So here's where it hits home with some folks. And this is where it hit home with me and I began to think of of some of these instances. If I'm letting unwholesome talk proceed from my mouth, whether it be obscenities, flirtations, dirty jokes, slander, lies, then I have a heart issue that leaves me polluted, corrupted, unclean, and let's just face it, sinful. If I'm hurting someone or, or, or harming, I'm sorry, if I'm hating someone or hurting someone out of malice, vengeance, resentment, then I have a heart issue that leaves me defiled and sinful. If I am not loving others the way that God has instructed, whether it be commandments 5 through 10 or the greatest commandment number 2, then I have a heart issue and then I have something that leaves me defiled and sinful. If I'm not loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, the way that God has commanded me in the first four of commandments or the greatest one commandment, then I have a heart issue that leaves me defiled and sinful. It's not difficult to listen to what Jesus is teaching here, and it's certainly not hard to understand. We like to use the excuse, I don't understand. Jesus talks in such such uh, mysterious ways that, that I can't read God's word and fully understand what he says. And, and, and we, can, we can try to use that excuse, but verses 12 through 15 shows the difference between the two kinds of people that are standing here. You see, there's the Pharisee and there's the disciples in this crowd. And there's other people, but they're going to fall into one of those two categories. The Pharisees were influential religious people in Judaism in the time of Christ and in the early church. They were known for their emphasis on on personal piety. The word Pharisee actually comes from a Hebrew word meaning separated. So they separated themselves from God, from other people, and in so doing, they began to separate themselves from God. Their acceptance of oral tradition, in addition to the written law and their teaching, that all Jews should observe all 600 plus laws in the Torah, including the rituals concerning ceremonial purification that we already talked about, aren't even in the Mosaic law, aren't godly laws. They're the people that listened to Jesus. Then we have the second group, the disciples. The Greek term for disciple in the New Testament is mathet, knew it, mathetes, which basically means student or learner. But a disciple is also a follower. And in biblical sense, it's someone who adheres completely to the teachings of another, making them his rule of life and conduct, making his teacher his master. And I believe that both listened to what Jesus said, and I believe that both understood what Jesus was teaching in this passage. You see, I believe the Pharisees understood the truth so well that it offended them, just like Peter and the disciples had said. It convicted them of all of their own sin, and they went away angry or upset, and instead of accepting the truth, they decided to plot against Jesus and kill him. You guys ever do that? When you can get get convicted of your sin? This Bible thing just makes me so mad. The preacher's just picking on me. And I make it a really big point to not pick on anybody's sin and just leave the Bible to put it out there. You can be upset with what God says. I don't want you upset with me, but this is part of what I do. But the Pharisees heard it. They were convicted. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying, and they were like, I hate this guy. I hate this guy. And they went out and they tried to kill him. 
Jesus uses Isaiah in our passage today to describe them. These are the people that honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. These men and their religious ideas, they are not planted by God. And Jesus was convinced and prophetically says these people will be uprooted. And you know what happens when Jesus uproots roots and weeds. They get thrown in the fire. They listened. They understood. They were blind walking towards destruction. And those who would listen to them were headed for the same fate. And you know what Jesus tells his disciples about them? He says, don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. They're, they're, they're doing this out of their own accord, out of their own will. Don't worry about them. Worry about yourself. The disciples understood the truth and the beginning to feel conviction. You see that they stuck around and they asked questions and they grew in their desire to hear the truth and will eventually respond in repentance and faith. That's the second, the disciple. They'll feel the conviction. They'll stick around. They'll ask questions and they'll grow in their desire for the truth. The question that I gave to myself and to others is, which one are you? And then finally, if what we eat doesn't make us clean, if tradition and ceremony can't make us clean, if washing our hands, going to church, praying, being religious doesn't make us clean, then what will make us clean? And the only thing that there is left is nothing but the blood of Jesus. Admitting that you've sinned, believing that God loved you enough to send Jesus to die for your sin, confessing him to be your Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. As Angie shared this morning, turning from your sin and trusting in Jesus, that's what makes you clean. It's the only thing that makes you clean. And the question for you this morning is after hearing what Jesus has said, will you experience the conviction and walk away? Or will you see how much Jesus loves you and come to him in repentance and faith? Would you look to, like to put your faith in Jesus this morning? Heavenly Father, God, we... Um, sometimes look at passages like this and they, and they hurt. Um, God, some of us who don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we, we have one way of responding to it, but God, those who already know Jesus Christ, those who are our, his disciples, God, when we look at those lists sometimes, God, we realize we're not where we should be. And God, even though that that sin won't separate us from God forever. God, it's keeping us from being in a right relationship with you. It's keeping us from being a good testimony. It's keeping us from being good witnesses to our family, to our friends. God, sometimes even to our enemies. And I wonder what the crowds would think about what's coming out of our mouths, and what's coming out of our actions. Would they see what's truly on our hearts? But God, you give us the opportunity to be clean. You give us the opportunity to, to be pure. You give us the opportunity to be truly holy and righteous, just as you are holy and righteous. And that opportunity comes from only knowing your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we know him by what we read in scripture, by what we've been taught through scripture. We know him through your spirit as he reveals him to us. And we can know him is not only a teacher, but we can know him as our Lord and Savior by confessing our sins to you and believing in Jesus Christ and asking for forgiveness. God, if someone would want to do that this morning, I pray that you would give them the boldness to come during the hymn of invitation. God, if there is a Christian here, a believer here that needs to, to confess their sins, God needs to begin living um, their lives in a way that would be pleasing to you, not by man's laws, but by your command to love you and to love others. God, that they would come to the altar this morning and pray. Seek forgiveness and seek restoration. Just as David said, create in me a clean heart.
and renew within me a right spirit. God, I ask that you would do this this morning for us because you can. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen.